I plan to stay drug free. I plan to stay drug free. I plan to stay drug free. I pledge to be drug free. I pledge to stay drug free. And good afternoon. Welcome to Expose Under the Sun, sponsored by the Detroit Native Sun newspaper. I'm your host, Darwin Griffin, and I hope that you will agree with me that this will be a very enlightening half an hour of conversation with my special guest, Famika Edmund. And before we get started, uh, our show is live, and our call in numbers are area code 313 868 0342. 313-868-0351 or 313-868-4336 and our website is www.tv33whpr.com and as you already know maybe a couple of you might not but we are also streaming live in the awesome cities of Detroit under the Honorable Mayor Michael Duggan and also under the auspices of the Honorable Mayor of the great city of Highland Park, Michigan, Mayor Hubert Yacht. I just wanted to say before we get started, I uh, hope everyone had a very safe and a very blessed holiday weekend. I know a lot of you probably are still having a difficult time trying to get back into the swing of things, going back to work today. Uh, maybe you had a little bit too much barbecue, but with the pandemic going on, hopefully you got a chance to either get a chance to talk to some of your loved ones or get a chance to spend some time with some of them. I uh, just want to, um, you know, uh, express uh, my family. Um, we had a loss in our family. Um, my brother's wife's sister made her transition over the weekend and so it's it's just a little tough when you have holidays that come about and you want to have a good time to spend with family and friends but it's sad sometimes when you're reminded of a person that makes a transition during that time so i just want to um you know express uh to my other side of the family the harris side uh the loss of edna harris um Beautiful person, beautiful spirit, great heart, and you know I, I think that the one thing that everybody will say about Edna was that she always brightened up your day. Whenever you saw her, whenever you saw her post on Facebook, you either saw the smile that brightened your day up, or you saw her hair color, which also brightened your eyes. So when you would look to see some of the different colors that she would wear between the greens, the reds, the purples, the blues, I mean, I don't think there was a color that was common for her, but um, she was a very, very uncommon person, but she was very, very much loved and very much liked and very much respected. So she is joining our ancestors and we too will join her as well as our ancestors one day. But just to express, um, you know, uh, love goes out to Margaret, to Dorothy, to Marvin, uh, to their mother, and to the many, many nieces and nephews. Uh, and, you know, express again our deepest love and our sympathies. We know that God has her and she's in the best hands that she could ever ask to be in right now and the best caregiver that she could ever ask to care for her as well. Okay, now we're going to have a conversation about something that probably is a subject that when people start talking about, you either hear people whispering or you hear people bragging about 
some people just have regular conversation about it. But we're going to talk a little bit about um, HIV. We're going to talk a little bit about STDs, STIs, and we're going to talk about just the what everybody hears when you hear about the subject of sex education. So uh, for the people that may be able to be enlightened by this conversation, great. But some of you may also find out there were some myths that you may have heard about or talked about that you may find out different today with my special guest. Again, my special guest, for those of you that may not know her, she goes out to a lot of the schools. She educates young people about the, uh, how people can be susceptible to some of the STIs, to HIV, and she gives very, very good workshops, you know, to young people about educating them about the usage of condoms, the usage in terms of, say, of other um, things that they could use to prevent someone from either contracting, you know, a STD or an STI. But again, my special guest today, her name is Famika Edmund, and she is the founder of The Love of Her. Famika, thank you for being on the show today. Well, thank you for having me. Um, I would like to extend my condolences to you and your family. Thank you. Um, at this time. But thank you again for having me. Um, I look forward to being interviewed today and definitely getting more education out to the community. I think that's very important. Well, we definitely are glad that you were able to go and, you know, uh, come in and you honored me by having the opportunity, especially right after the holiday, to come on the show. So I definitely appreciate you, you know, well, no following problem. up on this invitation to no come on the problem. show. Okay, let's get right to the topic. Basically, tell, first of all, tell what is the love of her? So for the love of her, I kind of created that um, back in 2017. Me and my friend came up with the concept. Um, one of the reasons I did um, come up with this organization was because I looked at the need in the community. I had received a call from a young lady's mother whose daughter for the first time had intercourse and ended up being exposed and, um, and contracting herpes. And unfortunately, the young lady did try to kill herself. And um, so the mother knew somebody had passed along her information, to, my information to her to come and speak to her daughter because they knew I used to do case management. So don't do I don't, that's not what I'm in the field of doing at this time. But I felt it was important for me to go out and speak to her, especially because of the circumstances what happened. So when I did go out, we spoke, and, you know, and I let her know, you know, this is not a death sentence. It's something that is treatable, that as long as she's taking her meds and she knows when she's having flare-ups, that's the time that she needs to let anybody who she may encounter sexually know that she may have an outbreak. So um, then in the process, she also found out her sister had been exposed and was living with herpes. So it just showed me how much of stigmatizations that we have around things and we don't address certain things. And I think because of the way she was shamed, that's why she felt like her only resort would be to kill herself because she felt like it was a death sentence. And I think once she was educated on her, which the virus that she had at this time, she was able to better deal with what was going on. But she also had wanted to go to an organization that she could speak with women that looked like her and might have been going through the same walks of things that she was going through. And so then um, I told her I would look into some different organizations near the Wayne State area. Unfortunately, I really was not able to find anything. So um, I did try to see if it was something we could implement in the programming that I do at work. but with grants a lot of those grants are not driven for women health care they're more driven towards men especially black men who are having sex with other men so there was no funding so i was like okay you know what i'm going to do something and so that's how me and a friend of mine came up with the idea for the love of her and so we go out we do workshops they're either 
one hour workshops or five week workshops just depending on what the person wants when they have us come out to facilitate the workshops but it's um when we do the five weeks it's an empowerment the first week we go into women health care we go into domestic violence um by the time they are finished with the last five weeks you have a leadership so that way the hopefully the skills that you gain is skills that you can start applying to your life whether it's your professional or your personal life now, what age groups do you usually have these workshops with? Um, we have done as young as 15 and as old as 50. So it just depends, you know. I don't designate it just being to a certain demographic. The only demographic right now I really geared towards is women, period. It doesn't matter what their nationality is. So i um done workshops up in the Flint area. We've done some at Wayne State. Um, we also have done some for the Rufella Center. We've done, ran a couple of workshops for them, um, especially like when we were going through COVID. We did an empowerment series um, to give people better coping skills to deal with our current situation. Now, what would you recommend as an age that a parent should talk to their son or their daughter about um, the STDs or STIs, you know, you talked about like with herpes, mm -hmm. or you're talking about gonorrhea or some other, you know, sexually transmitted, you know, disease. What age do you think they should have this conversation with their children? Well, their I think about? parents initially need to start having conversations about a child's sexuality when they start getting aroused and maybe, you know, fondling this. So start teaching them their body parts and the, the proper names for their body parts and not give the nicknames. One, because if something ever happens to that child, they should be able to be, convey to you if they have to go to court for anything, they need to know the, the, um, the names of like the vagina and not v, the V or whatever. So you want to teach them the proper names for their body parts. And then after that, I say like around element in the elementary going into middle school, those conversations about sex and sexually transmitted disease should be started incorporated into your conversations. So what are some of the myths? Cause I know I, I can tell a myth that I've heard about people contracting, um, like gonorrhea, for example, that you could sit on a toilet seat. And if somebody had it and you sat on the toilet seat when somebody else had sat on there and had gonorrhea, that you could contract it that way. What What are some of the other myths that you hear that people, you it's, know, it's have been so, saying? It's so many, especially like, um, like you said, oh, you can get it from the toilet seat, which a lot of times those things cannot, those germs will not live for a long period of time. You have to really like saturate yourself into it and you're not gonna get that from getting from a toilet seat. M many times it's direct contact and not using protection that is putting you at exposure for an STD or HIV. Um, another myth is if someone who has HIV and you go behind them and eat the same utensils that that's gonna put you at risk. It is very minute. And the um, virus, if it is in someone's saliva, is very minute. It can't be just passed on from personal contact like that. It has to be direct penetration. You coming in contact with that person's bodily fluids. Now, not to say that there is no STD that you can't get from skin to skin contact, but the other big ones like gonorrhea, chlamydia, syphilis, and um, HIV, those are more direct with bodily fluids so now when I know that it was a time I think when they were concerned about um, through blood or through sweat is that ways that it's contracted well back in the day um, especially if someone had a blood transfusion um, you know they did not realize at the beginning when we had the, the beginning of the epidemic with HIV that we needed to test the blood but now they are doing lots of thorough testing before they even provide somebody with a transfusion as far as sweat that's another thing you're not going to get it from somebody's sweat so if you're playing basketball with somebody and they sweat and all of a sudden they wipe the sweat off or something like that you're not going to contract it, hits it that you, way. you're not going to contract it that no, way okay no. and so now what are some of the main 
vehicles that it is transmitted. I know we talked about the, you know, with the needles. Right. You know, in terms of, say, where if you use someone else's needle that they had injected something into them with, and if that person was infected with the HIV, you could contract it that way. Correct. What are some of the other ways? I know you said the penetration. In penetration. Terms of, say, it can be contact. from vaginal, anal sex. Um, they have not. Um, there's still a lot of studies out right now about breast milk. Um, they do not encourage women who are HIV positive. They do have children to breastfeed because that is one form of way of transmission. Um, it can be passed from saliva, but the, the risk factor is so much lower with oral sex than it is with penetration sex, whether it be vaginal or anal sex. Those are really your main two routes. And it still can be transmitted if um, through blood if, like I was saying, if the blood has not been tested, if they have received it. But the steps that they take now, it does prevent from people being exposed to it from, from like, a blood transfusion. So now, two, two other questions I want to ask you, too, when it comes to the transmission. One, if a mother has HIV, mm -hmm. is that automatically transmitted into their son or daughter? No. If they're pregnant? No. Now, back in the day, they did see that. But with the medications that we have out now and if we know that the mother is pregnant and um what they do they adjust her um antiviral um hiv medications to make sure that she stays so virally suppressed now as long as the mom stays virally suppressed she is not going to transmit the hiv virus on to the baby now the biggest concern that they do have is after mom has the baby and with the breastfeeding. That's why here in the state they do not encourage moms to breastfeed their babies because of the risk factor of them passing that along through their breast milk to the baby. Now is that the same thing for like for herpes or for gonorrhea? Is that I mean or syphilis is that the same honestly, thing honestly um, there hasn't been a lot of study as far as like if mom I mean if you have a lesion uh, a canker, like say for instance, you have a canker around the breast area, I wouldn't be um, putting my child on my breast and breastfeeding because then that's more that direct, direct skin contact I was talking about. Like if you have an open canker, that you can potentially expose somebody else to whatever, if whether it's herpes or whether it's syphilis. Because mm -hmm. also with syphilis, you do have the cankers at the beginning. So, so uh, what's the difference between herpes and or gonorrhea and syphilis? It is the strains, uh, also the type of um, symptoms that you get from one to the other. Um, with chlamydia, you're going to get more everything um, isolated in the vaginal area. So you may have growing pain, you may have pelvic pain. Sometimes women might experience um, bleeding and stuff in between their periods. Um, discharge and some of the symptoms with gonorrhea and chlamydia kind of mimic their self so that's why a lot of times people do not know they may have one or the other um, with the herpes is more you're going to see the outbreaks with the canker sores and stuff around sometimes the mouth area you might even have them down in your genital area as well so these are open sores they're open sores and so now with men if they have had exposure to someone who has had who has chlamydia what are some of their symptoms that they would so show? for them for men um if they do get symptoms because sometimes they don't get symptoms okay. and unfortunately with them not getting the symptoms it can put them in further risk because then they're not getting tested and they're not getting um, treated for the chlamydia or gonorrhea um but if they do get symptoms usually they will get like a drip from the penis area, uh, a nasty kind of discharge. And they, like I said, they may get some generalized growing pains in the growing area. So now you said some men may not have symptoms. Correct. And so if they don't have symptoms, will they ever develop symptoms? It just depends on the person. Sometimes they may, and they may not develop it until the disease has, it went from an infection to a disease okay. and it's progressed itself. So by then, they may have symptoms, but there might be 
some damage done along the way because of how long it stayed dormant and not treated. Um, like with women, for example, if we don't get tested and treated for like chlamydia and gonorrhea, it can cause us to be fertile and um, sterile where we can't have kids later down the line. So these are things you have to think about um, too. The longer you have it and you're not treating and if you're having unprotected sex with other people, you're just gonna keep continuing to pass it along to other people. So the main thing is, is that if you do have that, you need to let the person know that you may be in, about to engage in some type of activity that you do have it so that they can protect themselves. Correct. Now, in, in the city of Detroit, where are some of the highest areas that you found through statistics that people may be susceptible to having um, an STI or HIV. So for the last two years, we've noticed our numbers have been high, like on the furthest part of the west side, like 48219 area. I wrote the, let me write, get the right zips for you. Um, the 48235, 48227, and 48228 area. On the east side, we've seen a high prevalence of HIV, STD, chlamydia, and gonorrhea, and it was in the 48205. 48224 area. And now, why is that? A lot of it I really feel in looking at our area has to do, I feel, with accessibility. Um, we are an automotive city, but we also don't have mass transportation here. So a lot of times, Many people don't have a way of getting to the, the clinics. Then you have to also look at the um, what's available as far as health care in these areas. We have Sinai Grace on the on the east on the west side, but unfortunately it has a bad stigma and a lot of people do not like going to their facilities. So if people have a mistrust with the health care system, a lot of times they're not gonna go. So I feel that plays a big factor. Also education. If people are not aware of what resources are available in their community or the reason why they need to get tested on a, uh, at least an annual basis or I also feel if you have a new partner, this is a conversation you and your partner need to have. But I also feel that education also has to start at home. And a lot of times in the black community, these are not conversations that we're having at home. Because that seems like that's a tough conversation to have with a new partner, especially if you ask him or her to get tested. I mean, does that kind of um, make somebody think that you don't trust them if you tell them that you haven't had any symptoms or you aren't, you know, you haven't been involved with a lot of partners or something mm -hmm. in the past? I mean, some people will take it that way. I think that's why we have to put more um, uh messaging around it and change the narrative to how we've been thinking about um, sex and when we talk about um, protecting ourselves, that that should be something that we should be able to have those conversations. It shouldn't get weird. And I feel like if you're getting into a new relationship, I should know what's going on with you. You should know what's going on with me. So we're starting at a clean slate and I'm not coming in there with anything that I'm going to give you and vice versa. So, but unfortunately, because these are not conversations that we were brought up on and it never, you know, me growing up, it wasn't a conversation my mom had with me. I had to learn from my peers. I had to learn from what I saw on TV. Um, it wasn't like, um, you know, my mom sat down. She barely told, talked about the birds and the bees as far as like periods with me. And that I had to find out on my own as well. So, you know, the, it, we have to start changing the conversations, how we talk to our kids and even amongst each other. Because I think once we make it where it's more normalized, then people will be more willing to have those conversations. So now in the short period of time that we have left, basically the main thing that you would advise persons to use to protect themselves against because a lot of times people use condoms to protect themselves for two reasons one is to get pregnant mm -hmm. keep someone from getting pregnant and then the other is from catching a sexually contracted you know disease right but now the thing is is that besides the condoms are there anything else that a person can use to keep from transmitting or keep from contracting a so disease now you have um, dental dam. I don't. I'm not. I'm not sure if people are aware what dental dam usage for. If you're into oral sex, 
and you're um, having oral sex, you can use it for anal sex or you can also use it for vaginal sex. And it's just, or if you don't have dental dam available, you can also use cellophane. And you just place it in the area so that way it's creating a barrier between you and the other person and you're not being exposed to their bodily fluid. Um, you also have female condoms and there are men who do, if they engage in anal sex, that they just take the ring out but and it can be inserted into the anal area area as well and women as well and one thing that's nice with it when a woman do, does put that in place they can wear it eight up to eight hours and so if they know uh, there's a possibility they may engage in sex during the course of the day they can put it in at the beginning of the day and just it has it can stay in for at least eight hours um you have finger cots because remember i was saying you have to be very careful sometimes if somebody has canker sores and having skin to skin contact so you have finger cots which actually goes over your finger um the only thing with the finger cots it still leaves the rest of the hand exposed so sometimes it is recommended for people to just use a regular non-latex glove um and then um what else besides condoms you abstinence <laughs> it's usually the best the yeah best thing. now just just real quick we've got one minute left condoms what type because you, you you see the two different types of condoms mm -hmm. what's the best type of condom that somebody should use so we actually a couple of years ago did a needs assessment to find out from the community and get some feedback and make it make it short we only no got about I'm, a make it real short um what was the best so between lifestyle and trojan people prefer trojan they um the many many of the things that i've heard back is that they rip easy lifestyle lips rips easy um or they're very uncomfortable so a lot of people do like trojan condoms so they seem to be the better right now on the market and um the more go-to that people go to okay and so now the other thing too is that do not put any lubricant on the condom because it breaks the condom down correct correct so don't put vaseline or any other no, type you don't of do lubricant all that. on the condom correct it should already be pre-lubricated from the factory correct okay so we can dispel that myth that correct. some people may have and can I say one thing about the condoms too? Make sure that you are checking the expiration dates on those condoms. Um, if they're expired, throw them away because after their expiration date, you can't guarantee the effectiveness and they do change their composition. Also, okay. you wanna make sure that you're storing them where they're in a neutral um, temperature area. You don't wanna store them in your car where it might get too hot in your car or you don't wanna store them um, somewhere where it's going to be freezing cold because what happens is when it does change its consistency when it gets too hot they come gummy or it, if you if they get frozen they will change to like glass consistency okay. so those are some of the things that people should make sure that they're looking at well Ms. Edmonds we definitely gonna have to ask you to come back again <laughs> I'm sure there's a lot of questions that our audience would love to ask and you know to have you to answer you know in the future but again thank you for being my special guest today we'll have to have you back again definitely uh this is expose under the sun sponsored by detroit native sun newspaper my special guest is famika Edmund, and she is a person who you can learn a lot from so just real quick Give your contact information because we've got we're about to run out of time, but I want to give you your contact. Is there a website or something that somebody can go on they if they can, want to contact? Me. You can email me at for the love, for the love of her mm -hmm. at gmail dot com. Okay, great. Okay, now if you'd like to advertise in the Detroit Native Sun newspaper, you can contact Miss Valerie Lockhart at three one three four five seven five nine four four, and you can pick up the copy of the Detroit Native Sun News in your local. Kroger supermarkets. Again, condolences, especially to my family when it comes to my lovely, lovely sister, Edna Harris. Again, stay tuned next week. Have a great and safe week. I'm your host, Darwin Griffin. You've been watching Expose Under the Sun. Peace and make sure that you are a blessing to someone else. Thank you.